with selected passages from the book of Daniel. I've entitled the sermon series, I Hear You. What happens when our belief actually matches our behavior? to begin this series, five-part series of messages, this morning with the sermon entitled, Standing Up in a Bow-Down World. Standing Up in a Bow-Down Sometimes our faith, brothers and sisters, gets us in big trouble. Jesus shared with us that we would be persecuted and reviled against all because we're his namesakes. I hate to snatch the rug from under those of you who've romanticized the Christian journey. But being a follower of Jesus Christ is not, I repeat, is not a flowery bed of ease. Don't get me wrong. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus always will be the very best thing that ever happened to me. But he did warn us that sometimes doing right will lead to things going all wrong. Let's subpoena Stephen, if you will, on the grounds of his experiences in Acts chapter 7. Deacon Stephen, do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated, Stephen in the witness box. Stephen, you were chosen by the people of God to represent them because you were of good report. You were full of wisdom and of the Holy Spirit. Is this true? Correct. If you'd be so kind, Stephen, would you tell the court what happened when you stood up for your faith when the world around you was bowing down. Well, I was trying to please God the best way that I knew how with my life. That angered the powers that be, and they falsely accused me of blasphemy, had me arrested and tried in court. I testified to the whole truth of the gospel, and it enraged the court because their sins had been exposed. They drug me outside of the city gates and they stoned me to death. I wasn't worried though, because God opened the heavens to me and he welcomed me into eternal rest and my eternal reward. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for your testimony. But what final word would you leave with the court? I think I tell the court this morning that serving the Lord will pay off after a while. Yeah. I dare you to allow your belief to match your behavior and God will be pleased with how you live. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a matter of allowing our lives to become the extricated evidence of the true and living God. The God who is able and a God who is attentive to those who put their trust in him. These three young friends of Daniel, they do not possess a shallow religion. They have a serious relationship with God. One that's, predic that's not predicated on the shaky ground of prosperity which focuses on what we can ascertain, what we can receive, what we can get from God. But they had a serious relationship with the Lord that was based on the stability of unconditional 
eternal love and the promise of deliverance from certain death. Without a doubt, the world is a place of conformists and it is easy to emulate whatever everyone else is doing. However, God is calling us. He is calling us to be transformed into the image of his dear son, which is not an easy process, but it's worth it. It's even worth going through the fire. Yes. Briefly consider with me three movements of this particular pericope, and then we will hastily make our way to the Lord's table. Consider with me first the prey, second the predator, and third the deliverer. Let's unpack first of all the prey. Captured from their homeland, these Hebrews are pressured along with Daniel not to, to change who they are because of where they are. They are not home, uh, they are captives. They, they now have been challenged to accept meat that had been dedicated to idols. And the king's wine was offered to them in chapter 1. But they stood and refused to defile themselves with meat of idols and the king's wine. They committed themselves to a special diet for their bodies and, a spe and special books for their minds. I shared with 816 this morning that I wish I was giving a lecture in some, in, in the, before some of our children as they're headed back to school. Special diets for their bodies and special books for their minds. Trash in, trash out. You know, and so they had to be careful about what they allowed into their bodies and their minds. They were sanctified. They were set aside for God's own use. And that, brothers and sisters, <coughs> made them targets. Now they stand up. They stand up refusing to bow down at the sound of the music to worship the large erected image of an idol and clearly not the God of their ancestors. Standing up is an unpopular thing to do, but it is indeed the posture of heavenly pilgrims who are traveling through this bow down world. That, brothers and sisters, is the prey. Now let's turn our attention to the Predator. Predator. Evil. Evil is desperate for someone to infiltrate and to inhabit. Evil. Evil looks for someone to live in and someone to control, to infiltrate and to inhabit. For some, we are familiar with individuals who are residents, but not presidents. Well, your children are residents in your home. I would hope that they are not the presidents of your home. They are permitted to live there, but they are not to permitted to control anything. The evil wants to live in, and evil wants to control us. I'm reminded of a sermon by the late Dr. C.L. Franklin from Detroit, Michigan, who often suggested that Satan was too lazy to walk into prayer meeting. He sits at the front steps of the church and waits for some weak Christian to ride in on evil. Evil wants to infiltrate, and evil wants to inhabit. King Nebuchadnezzar was just grateful in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel had interpreted a dream for him, and the king showered him with thanks 
he showered him with gifts and made public declaration in verse 47 that Daniel's God is the greatest of all gods and he is the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries. Nebuchadnezzar was so grateful that he promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of the affairs of the province of Babylon. The implication here is that in one chapter, people will appear sane. In one chapter, people will appear friendly. And in the very next chapter, they'll switch up on you and expose who they really are. Tyler Perry, a popular playwright, uh, he plays the part of Medea in a series of movies, and Tyler Perry as Medea would say that when people show you who they are, believe them. Right. And Nebuchadnezzar switched up on them. In chapter 2, he was saying in chapter 2, was friendly. Chapter 3, he's unstable. Chapter 3, he's trifling. Chapter 3, he's mentally, emotionally, and socially duplicitous. I'm suggesting to you this morning, on the basis of this text, not to be surprised when people change on you. Nebuchadnezzar turned on these young men who was in service to him. All because their standing up was in the way of his ambition. I dare you, I dare you this morning to stand up and not bow down because causing your faith to take a back seat to convenience. Stand up in this bow down world. Can you hear it? The music is playing. Can you hear it? Everyone is cheering for you to bow as they conform, but I dare you not to be intimidated by the predators of this world and do not live your life as prey in this world. Stand up and not bow down. Finally, I want to share with you despite life's predators, that there is a deliverer. Fire. Fire is hot. Fire is unpredictable. Fire is a living and a breathing thing. Let me 
suggest to you that you may not be in need of a miracle. Miracles are reserved in the gospel for people who find themselves in abject misery. People whose backs are against the wall and they are out of options. Darling, you may not need a miracle. You just may need some more. You may need to take advantage of another option. You don't need liposuction. You need a diet and exercise. You don't need more money. You need a budget. Maybe your answer is not found in no, the Lord is causing bad things to happen to me and I can no longer afford my car or can no longer afford the apartment or home that I'm living in. When the truth of the matter is maybe you just need to give the car back and maybe you should move from where you are. You don't need a miracle. You've got options. Not only that, may I suggest to you brothers and sisters that as these individuals find themselves in the fire, God accompanies them in the fire. He does not prevent them from going into the fire. May I say to you that maybe things have not gotten hot enough yet for you. Maybe you are waiting for a way out and a way of escape. But God is waiting on your commitment and then he will become your companion. God, because of their commitment, he became their companion in the fire. An angelic presence showed up and gave them freedom. <laughs> they were in the fire, true enough, but they had freedom in the fire. They were standing up, <clears throat> they were walking around, not being burned and they don't even smell like smoke. There is no cure for diabetes. When a diabetic's sugar gets out of proportion, they are injected with insulin. Insulin does not cure the diabetic's ailment. But it does allow them to go on despite they have the problem. That's what I'm trying to tell you about God and His grace. As we approach the Lord's table this morning for the celebration of communion, may we be reminded that every time hell pounds get on our trail, and every time things may not be going according to our plans, that God injects us with a dose of grace and allows to go on despite we still have the problem. Yes. May I find a place to land this lesson when I tell you that our God is a deliverer. Yes. He specializes in setting his people free, especially in the face of predators who don't know that God doesn't leave his children when life heats up. God, brothers and sisters, never leaves our side. Lest I hold you too long because my soul is getting happy here, I dare you. I dare you. I dare you to use your fire story to get the world's attention. They won't know that God is a deliverer or that Jesus Christ saves unless you show them the way. I dare you. I dare you to tell them that Satan had you bound. <laughs> But Jesus lifted you. I dare you to tell them that you used to cry all night long, but Jesus lifted you. Tell them that you're so glad that when the devil thought he had you, that Jesus came and grabbed you. I dare you. I dare you to stand up and be a witness because we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to save this bow down world. Stand up, even though the world is bowing down. And all of God's people said,